All right, we are live, ladies and gentlemen. Former Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi was recently confronted outside her home by a number of Code Pink protesters accusing her of supporting genocide in Gaza. Pelosi, staying nice and level-headed, accused the protesters of being nothing more than a bunch of paid shills for the communist China and Putin regimes. After looking into the accusation, it appears as though there is a well-established, quote-unquote, global web of Chinese propaganda that has infected media and liberal organizations around the world. We're going to be talking about all this and more in episode 434 of the In the Tank podcast. All right, welcome to the In the Tank podcast. As always, I'm your host, Donald Kendall. Joining me today, I've got Jim Lakely, VP of the Heartland Institute. How are you doing today, good sir? I'm doing just fine. Um, I meant to say in the private chat that I experienced a little bit of lag during your opening, and I and I meant to do it in the private chat. I did it in the public chat, and uh, apparently somebody else also saw it. So uh, uh, let's hold on, buckle our seatbelts, and hopefully, technically, everything is okay. But I've been, I've been watching the... Um, uh, as, as, as I mentioned last week, I've been watching the Mann versus Stein and Simberg trial, climate trial of the century. The hockey stick is put on trial. It's a, actually a huge free speech trial, if you think about it. Um, and we're going to be talking about that tomorrow on the main channel at the Heartland Institute on Climate Change Roundtable. So at the same time as, you, uh, as you're watching this today, but just on Friday. So be sure to go over there and check that out tomorrow. Stein versus the man. That's, uh, that's how I always look at it. Chris Talgo. He is the editorial director here at the Heartland Institute. How are you doing today, good sir? Well, I'm doing better than last week because this thing called the sun actually made an appearance in the Chicagoland area, Donnie, and I'm like, don't know what to do. Here comes the sun, everybody. Mm -hmm. It is a nice, balmy 42 degrees outside. Very nice. Uh, before we get going... I do have to put out that message that I say at the beginning of all of these videos, and that's mostly to our audio-only listeners that are probably catching the show on a Friday or later. First off, why don't you leave a review for us on iTunes? It'd be greatly appreciated. And you could join our show a day earlier on Thursdays at noon Central Time, where we are live streaming on Facebook and YouTube and X and Rumble. And you could join the conversation, throw your comments or questions in the chat. Maybe we'll show your comment to the screen. Maybe we'll address your questions on the fly. Also, you could support the show by uh, by uh, using that super chat. We have that super chat functionality enabled if you want to support the show that way. Or if you don't want to spend a dollar, just want to spend a couple of seconds hitting that like button, subscribing, sharing this content, or just leaving a comment on the video. All helps break through those big tech algorithms that prevent content like this from being shown to more people. So a um, little... little I have my notes shared with the gentleman on the podcast, but there was just a, a last minute thing that I forgot that I wanted to talk about because it relates to Davos. Obviously, you know, my fixation on the Davos crowd and everything related to them. But what reminded me of it was in a group chat that uh, me and Jim are in, in a former colleague of ours, uh, the former colleague of ours, one of the more snarky people that I know, he uh, asked the group, what our favorite Taylor Swift conspiracy is. And after Jim responded in an equally snarky fashion about lizard people or something like that, I responded that my favorite Taylor Swift centric conspiracy theory is the fact that we just got off of Davos 2024, where last week we covered how the primary topic of Davos was misinformation, disinformation, fake news, uh, the spread of deep fakes, and all of this stuff. And so a week long, all of these super influential people in government and business were just sitting there getting lectured by all of these experts about how big of a problem all of these things are, deep fakes, misinformation, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, just priming them to want to do something about it. And then Davos 2024 ends. And then a week later, News breaks about deep fakes relating to Taylor Swift, who has been promoted as America's sweetheart for the last, I don't know, 
entire football season, it seems like. And what happened after that? Everyone started calling for legislation. Everyone was demanding Congress do something about it. They talked about it at White House press conferences. The CEO of Microsoft came out, who had a specific panel at Davos, talking about deep fakes and all of this sort of stuff. He specifically was calling on Congress to do something about it. So the timing is just perfection. I don't know if that rises to the level of quote unquote conspiracy theory, but I'll grow. I'll, I'll throw it in there. Uh, Jim, what do you think? What do you think? Is the, is the timing of this just perfection or what? You mean with Taylor Swift being the boyfriend of Travis Kelsey, Travis Kelsey, who is in, I think one of every three commercials on television, <laughs> it features Travis Kelsey, uh, uh, including getting the jab. Uh, you know, so he's he's making lots of money from Pfizer to tell people to get their um, shots and boosters. Uh, what I like about those commercials is that it's a complete waste of money. There's no way <laughs> they're working. People are not are not really sliced about getting uh, the jabs and their boosters and all of that stuff. Even people in the so-called risk at risk community. So that's just Pfizer throwing its money away. But I actually I, I wish we weren't talking about this. I wish um, the the Buffalo Bills at first and then the uh, the Baltimore Ravens. Both had an opportunity to spare us a Taylor Swift dominated Super Bowl, and they both failed at that job. So, uh, yeah, here we are. Uh, Taylor Swift. Actually, I saw I saw something the other day. the The relationship between Taylor Swift and Jason Kelsey has made the Kansas City Chiefs and the NFL instantly like three hundred and thirty million dollars in revenue. I mean, that's it's just amazing. I mean, love or hate Taylor Swift, and I think some of her music is okay, and uh, but she is the biggest star in the world and she might be the one of the biggest stars ever. I mean, I, I was thinking this morning, like Madonna was a big star. I mean, she goes by one name. She was the queen of pop. She, if everybody knew who Madonna was, Taylor Swift is making Madonna look like a, a cabaret singer in comparison to fame. It's really <laughs> quite amazing. And so it seems like uh, this is just Taylor Swift's world. She affects, she has, she, she has something to do with everything in our lives and we're just living in it. Right. Right. Yeah. The, uh, it's funny because my brother was very much rooting for the Ravens in that past game, and uh, his significant other is a huge Swifty. And it was funny because he was like, I'm not even going to watch the Super Bowl. I can't stand all of those. I'm not going to watch the Super Bowl. And while she was super excited that Taylor Swift's on the camera and all of that, so then later on, I texted her. I'm like, hey, are you going to. I think you're going to be hosting the Super Bowl party this year. <laughs> and my brother, he's not invited. But uh, I mean, Chris, this. This, I think the timing of this, I mean, she's she's the basically the figurehead for everything when it comes to establishment stuff right now, or at least that's what they're trying to promote her as. But now she's going to be the figurehead of collectivist action against misinformation and all of that. At least that's how they're seemingly trying to set it up in the media narrative. Am I reading too much into this? What do you think? And the timing is interesting, although I don't know if there's a direct connection or not. Uh, one of the other things that, you know, Taylor Swift is just all over the news all the time. But one of the other things that's been in the news the past week or so is that uh, Joe Biden is really counting on her for uh, an endorsement in 2024. And they are on the they are under the assumption that if Taylor Swift comes out and endorses Joe Biden, his reelection is a total lock. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't I don't. Uh... I, I I don't even have a comment on that. But Did, uh, can, I, can I ask you one question? Uh, do you think that that uh, hearing yesterday in Congress about uh, social media and all that is is related to this at all? Because that was one of the hmm. uh, topics that was covered. I'm telling and you the timing of it. So the other thing about this, it's as if this was the first time that like deep fake technology and generated generative AI has ever been used to do something like this. What happened to Taylor Swift, which obviously I don't condone or anything like that, but it hasn't like this has been a thing for years and like it's been right. talked about in the media for years. It's just now they decided this moment a week after Davos 2024 wrapped. It happens with Taylor Swift. We're going to make a huge deal out of it. And I just think like the momentum of all of that, I, I just, I, it's hard for me to just say, oh, it's a coincidence and move on with my life. To me, that's, that's the conspiracy. Well, are like. you, are you alluding to the, um, the possibility that this will, uh, you know, cause uh, action in the misinformation realm and deep fakes and all that? And is that what you're, saying you think this is you know really about that they are oh, trying yes yeah okay. i mean like i said davos priming all of these people we got to do something about it 
And then they're like, okay, great, awesome. Taylor Swift thing happens. We got to do something about it. It's well, just yeah. like timing's perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. I, I get the idea of, you know, the, the deep fakes are a form of disinformation and purposeful to deceive people and all of that. Uh, and that will be used as an excuse to shut down free speech of everybody that doesn't toe the line with the regime, uh, be it the WEF, the global regime, or here in the United States and the Biden administration. So yeah, that I think that is a danger. And I think um, maybe you're onto something, Donnie, that it's not a coincidence that uh, you know deep fake worries are tied to Taylor Swift here. But one of the things that we have to keep pushing back on this is the idea that if, like, say there was a deep fake of, of well, <laughs> First of all, we would know it's a deep fake of Joe Biden if he actually gets out a full sentence that makes any any uh, comprehension at all. So okay. if, if he speaks like a normal human being on, who's man. 20, yeah, there you on, go, 20, 20 years younger than he actually is, then we'll know it's really deep fake. But it's the idea that if there was some sort of, let's just say this, led by China, a Chinese led deep fake campaign to m- convince Americans that Trump or Biden is saying this when it's not really them. The idea that people wouldn't be able to sniff that out and spread the word to other people um, is ridiculous. Obviously, if there's some sort of deep fake like that, people will know about it immediately and share it. So, so in the same places you would see a deep fake, you would get information from people telling you it's a deep fake and it's not real. Um, they just never seem to understand. Actually, I do think they understand that that's the case and they don't care. They just use it as a, as a pretext to silence them. Yeah, yeah see, but- I don't I don't know about that. I don't, I don't know about that. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, maybe it's just because I'm immersed in all of this stuff, but I think the October surprise going into the 2024 election is going to be some sort of deep fake level thing or something like that. Whether or not it's Trump, you know, some fake thing that Trump supposedly said or did that's been caught on audio or, or video uh, that turns out to be fake or some real thing that Biden said or did that they're just like, oh, I think this is fake. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's fake. When in reality, it's real. Something like that, I think, is bound to happen. And if it occurs close enough to the election, regardless of the, you know, people pointing out the truth of the matter, like the damage could be done in just like a, a 24 hours. You know, the, the correction is going to be printed on page 17 of the next day's paper. What are you going to say, Chris? I was going to say that, um, Donnie, you're, you know, really aware of this technology and how much it's, you know, uh, increasing in its, um, you know, accuracy in terms of, you know, depicting people in recent years. And, you know, yeah, of course, it could be used for, you know, high profile people like Donald Trump or Joe Biden, but it could also be used just across the spectrum for anybody that, you know, uh, runs afoul of the, you know, media narrative, you know, I'm just think like Ben Shapiro, they just, you know, make a video of him saying something outrageous. And then it's almost like a, he said, he said, so, I mean, this is going to, I think really like, you know, impact society more and more in the years to come as this technology just keeps advancing at, you know, a dizzying pace. Yeah. And the other thing, and, and Jim, you kind of were joking about this, but I think it's a real thing. Um, underscored by the South Korean president's story that I'd covered in past episodes when we were talking about deep fakes, where they will use this to make Joe Biden seem less dementia ridden and all of that. <laughs> like commercials that are going to be coming out closer to election time where he is actually talking with like authority and full cognitive awareness and all <laughs> of that. Like I'm going to be watching that being like, is this real or is this computer generated? Like, is this ai manipulated but the vast majority of the people watching those commercials that are going to be repeated day in and day out as the election appears probably won't be thinking that way so i I do think that this is this is going to be increasingly an issue and an issue that we're going to be talking about probably more and more on this podcast if stories like that do sprout up but um but let's get to our main topic i did want to talk about Neuralink and all of that but yeah We'll save that. We'll save that until when Jim gets one plugged into his head, <laughs> which I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah so uh, just, just so I can operate my coffee machine just by thinking about coffee. It'll make coffee. Exactly, for me. It'll be pretty exactly. cool. You just have the urge for coffee in the coffee yeah, machine. Yeah, suddenly he's brewing. Yeah, that'd be great. All right, let's get to our main topic. So like I started off the podcast saying, Nancy Pelosi had some visitors at her home that were yelling her uh, yelling at her about uh, what's going on in Gaza, accusing her of supporting genocide, laying down in front of her car, you know, normal stuff that you do on a Monday morning. Well, Nancy was not too happy about it. I think we have a video clip of kind of the tail end of this confrontation. Andy, if you have that, if you have that video clip of Nancy Pelosi, let's go ahead and 
and play that one, please. Both of you can get you in. Block the sergeant. Stop. Stop the genocide. Stop the Holocaust. Democrats want the ceasefire. The Democrats want the ceasefire. The Democrats want the ceasefire. <laughs> close it <laughs> so so for the audio only listeners it's a little harder to make out when you're uh you know just listen to the audio but you've got all the hallmarks of the the protesters and the code pink people when they're when they're kind of talking about this issue you know stop the holocaust stop the genocide uh, i think somebody yelled out that they know that it was an inside job calling for the ceasefire all all of kind of the standard talking points uh, but what was even harder to make out is while Nancy Pelosi's handler is kind of closing the door to get her safely in the car, Nancy Pelosi yells out, uh, what does she say? She says, go back to China where your headquarters is, <laughs> accusing accusing them of basically being paid shills by the you know Chinese Communist Party. And so this story was actually sent to me from a longtime loyal listener, Abel, who is in the chat right now. And, uh, you know, I thought it was interesting. You know, any any politician that's getting their feathers ruffled, especially on video, it's going to catch my attention. So I I watched the video and I heard her accusing these pro-Palestine Palestine protesters of being bought and paid for by China. And I thought it was pretty interesting, especially coming from Nancy Pelosi. So I, I, I went ahead and I gave it a Google. And one of the first articles that popped up was a Time Magazine article titled, Nancy Pelosi suggests foreign influence behind U.S. pro-Palestinian activism. What to know? And in the article, the author talks about the driveway incident and an interview Pelosi recently did on CNN with Dana Bash. Uh, during this interview, Pelosi claimed that calling for genocide is Mr. Putin's message. She referred to some pro-Palestinian protesters as plants and then called for the FBI to investigate these protesters. Pelosi has uh, made the case that Russia is trying to splinter the Democratic Party's base through uh, an American pro-Palestinian movement ahead of the 2024 election. So before we get into the China stuff, and let me just warn you, I went down a massive rabbit hole looking at all sorts of Chinese propaganda sorts of stuff, which the vast majority of this episode is going to be dedicated to. Before we get into that, though, Jim, what are your thoughts on this uh, this theory espoused by Pelosi that you know Russia and China are trying to foment discord in the Democratic Party ahead of the election? Well, I mean, first of all, I just want to say how much I enjoyed watching the hard left nut jobs uh, bother Nancy Pelosi for once instead of, uh, you know, doing something like, for instance, coming to one of our climate conferences and being obnoxious. And, uh, uh, you know, and I guess this is better than throwing a can of soup at the Mona Lisa, which happened last week. So, um, yeah, it's nice when the left turns on the left uh, on, on these sorts of things. But, yeah, I saw the clip. We're not going to play it on the podcast today, but the, the clip of. Nancy Pelosi on CNN uh, speaking with Dana Bash and saying that, you know, obviously, well, you know, there's no other reason why leftist protesters would ever be bothering me if they were not paid to do so by China or Russia or and or Russia. Right. And I think on that one, she just particularly said Russia, that this is a Russian operation to have these leftist protesters in front of her house. I mean, when I saw that, I'm like, does anybody really buy this stuff anymore? I mean, <laughs> The entire Russia hoax against Trump, I mean, it was obviously a hoax, even though uh, the Washington Post and New York Times will, will not be giving back their Pulitzers for um, an award, the most prestigious journalism award for telling the biggest lie in political history and keeping it going for five years. Uh, you know, the Russia thing was a hoax. Russia, 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 Russia. It's like, do people actually buy this garbage? I mean, could it just be Nancy Pelosi that the radical left are rabidly pro-Palestinian and you are not. And so they're going to get you, they're going to let you know it and they're going to get in your face about it because this is an extremely passionate topic for people on the left. Um, and so it, that just could be it, Nancy. It, it doesn't have to be funded by a foreign power. But I will tell you one thing that was proven to be funded by a foreign power, that being Russia. And that was um, leftist green groups were funded by Russians to stop the United States from exploiting and, and getting natural gas out of the ground and using it in our economy. Why? So that Russia would have more of the um, international 
natural gas market cornered and also to hurt the United States and hurt our economy and make us less efficient, make energy more expensive and all of that. But that was something that was actually proven that Russians were funding green groups to stop natural gas production in the United States. So Nancy, put up or shut up. I would like to have one person here, one, one, one of these people blaming China and Russia for things to show some actual evidence. And um, I think maybe we're going to see some evidence actually in this podcast, but Nancy Pelosi doesn't provide any. She just throws out that Russia or China red meat, foreign influences in our elections and foreign influence are bothering politicians like me uh, when I'm just trying to, you know, go to work in my in my luxury SUV. So um, if you're going to throw out these sorts of accusations, you need to have some proof. And Nancy Pelosi and a lot of people, the politicians on the left never have any. They just say it and they expect people to buy it. And I just like to think that most Americans have wised up to this and don't buy this garbage anymore. Yeah, I mean, Chris, what do you think about that? Because, you know, you and I have talked probably more than any two people uh, about just kind of the misinformation and the technology that's generative AI, deep fakes and all of that. And it's getting to a point where it seems like anything, even if you see it or hear it, you could just be like, ah, it's probably fake. You know, the protester is outside. Ah, it's probably paid for. It's just like whatever doesn't fit your worldview. Like you could just be like, ah, Russia, ah, China. Like you just make up things to make it like comport to your worldview. And it seems like that's what Nancy Pelosi is doing here. What do you think? Mm, I think that's a part of what she's doing here. Uh, I have a couple of things uh, before we even get into all this. How about that 49ers uh, giant scarf she was wearing? Wow. I didn't know she was <laughs> such a fan. And how about Paul? Getting the Porsche fix after that little, you know, drunken driving episode, uh, you know, earlier, what was it, mm. last year? So good to see that the Porsche, there it is. You can see it. It's a really <laughs> nice car, at least 100K. Glad, 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 glad to see it's parked, you know, per- perfectly in that garage. Okay, so, um, you know, Nancy Pelosi, I think, is, like Jim said, she's playing the Russia card, which has been played time and time and time again because it, it worked, I think, you know, so many times uh, before. Um, so I think that she just thinks, well, you know what, this worked, you know, in the past, so it'll work again. But like Jim said, and I completely agree with him on this a hundred percent, this shows the schism that is um enveloping the Democratic Party. And uh, you know, if I know that <clears throat> the core of this conversation is not gonna be about the Palestine, you know, Israel, Gaza ceasefire issue, but even in our backyard, Donnie, the Chicago City Council yesterday had a vote on a Palestine ceasefire, huh? Mayor Brandon Johnson actually cast a deciding vote and a bunch of uh, Chicago high school students left school to go and protest march about this. So wait a second, why does that have anything to do with this? You Hmm. would think that the people in Chicago, especially would be more concerned with, you know, the thousands and thousands of migrants who are, you know, causing chaos in the streets, but no, they're not. And just like, you know, what, What's going on there? How come the people of California are not up in arms about the status of San Francisco and the state of the of the uh, uh, California budget? I could think of a hundred things that are way more important in California than some you know s- ridiculous ceasefire you know th- that they want to uh, put in place that they wanted to put in place literally immediately after the Palestinians went in there and you know killed a couple thousand uh, you know. Um, uh, Israelis and, you know, still has 136 of them being held hostage. So I, I'm, I'm going kind of way out here. I know I'm getting, you know, far afield from probably what you want to focus on, but to me, it's just part of a much larger narrative. And I've had this conversation with, you know, people in, in recent weeks, people's <clears throat> understanding of how war should be conducted in 2024 is just so, so absurd. I can't, I can't even, you know, understand where they're coming from because war is nasty. War is collateral damage. War is also full of what they call the fog of war, meaning you don't know what's really happening. And for them to say that, wait a second, if, you know, the Israelis go in there and attack, uh, you know, the uh, Hamas militants who are using, you know, Palestinians as human shields and some Palestinians die in that process, well, then that makes that a Holocaust. I, it's just like I, I I cannot believe that we are even having this, that they are even trying to have this conversation. Whatever happened to, you know, never forget what happened in in 19, you know, 40s Germany was a Holocaust. That is this is nothing so far from a Holocaust. I mean, it's just it's it's not a genocide. All this stuff is ridiculous. It has to stop. And, you know, that's that's really where I'm coming at uh, on this. 
Yeah, I will say it's probably a little outside the purview of this episode, but uh, but I will say just kind of uh, branching off of one of the things that you said is just kind of like kind of war and how it's fought in this day and age. And one of the things that is a growing component of kind of the modern day warfare is information wars. And that is basically the topic of this podcast is information wars, propaganda and all that sort of thing. And one of the countries that is very uh practiced with this is china so this article that i first referenced that time magazine article this is kind of what set me off down this rabbit hole because they reference a couple of things the portion of that article um they there's a line that reads last august the new york times reported links between code pink and beijing i thought that was pretty interesting so it's not just some baseless accusation you know where they just accuse protesters of being astroturf by the conservatives or something stupid like that like the new york times is talking about this i'm gonna go see what they're talking about so i found this article new york times the article is called a global web of chinese propaganda leads to a u.s tech mogul the article is fascinating to say the least so fascinating in fact that i can't even believe that i hadn't heard about this before so the article discusses how there is a, quote, lavishly funded influence campaign that defends China and pushes its propaganda. And at the center is a charismatic American millionaire named Neville Roy Singham, who is known as a socialist benefactor of far left causes. Again, this is the New York Times talking about this. According to the New York Times, Singham, quote, works closely with the Chinese government media machine and is financing its propaganda worldwide through a, quote, tangle of nonprofit groups and shell companies. Some of the organizations involved include a think tank in Massachusetts, an event space in Manhattan, a political party in South Africa, news organizations in India, news organizations in Brazil, organizations known as No Cold War, which is a organization that apparently is just dedicated to kind of defending China and the anti-war group Code Pink. So reading from the article, it says the Times untangled a web of charities and shell companies using nonprofit and corporate filings, internal documents and interviews with over two dozen former employees of groups linked to Mr. Singham. Some groups, including No Cold War, do not seem to exist as legal entities, but are tied to a network through domain registration records and short shared organizers. While other moguls slap their names on foundations, Mr. Singham sent his money through a system that concealed his giving. That seems really above board. At its center were four new nonprofits with dust dry names like United Community Fund and Justice and Education Fund. They have almost no real-world footprints, listing their addresses only as UPS store mailboxes in Illinois, Wisconsin, and New York. So then get this. The New York Times article then contains a specific case of how this influence has been working. So they start talking about Jody Evans, who is the co-founder of Code Pink and a wife, the wife of uh, Mr. Singham says that she historically was critical of China. And they give an example of a tweet that she tweeted in 2015, where she said that we demand China stop their brutal repression of their human, their, their women's human rights defenders. Then in 2017, records show that Code Pink began receiving $1.4 million in donations from not one, but two groups linked to Mr. Singham's network. Now, more recently, Miss Evans, again, co-founder of Code Pink, has changed her tune on China. In an interview recorded in 2021, Miss Evans defended China against perceived U.S. aggression. And when asked about the prison camps of the Uyghurs, Evans defended the mass detention of Uyghurs, saying, you've got to do something. She uh, then was asked if she had anything negative to say about China, to which she responded, quote, I can't for the life of me think of anything. Oh, wait, she did actually have one negative thing to say. Apparently, she had difficulty using China's phone-based payment apps. Wow, a scathing criticism of the communist dictatorship. Wow, Code Pink must be so proud. So a whole bunch of leftist groups are being financed by socialist millionaire with ties to China. Jim, how the hell did I not know about this? Did you hear about this? I didn't. I didn't. Uh... 
Yeah, I think that's very interesting. I mean, I, I Code Pink's been around for a long time. Uh, I don't think they've been funded by China, obviously, the whole time. But I, I, my first ex, uh, exposure to them was actually covering the Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, recall governor campaign. What was that, 2002 or something? A long time. So they've been around a long time being disruptive, obnoxious, uh, and, and whatnot. But um, well, yeah, so... so <laughs> You know, I mean, again, it's, what a surprise. I mean, in uh, China funding uh, the disruption and chaos uh, in the United States. I mean, why in the world would they want to do something like that? Uh, I don't know. Um, maybe it's because it's their grand plan to replace us as the world's uh, global superpower. And it's actually, with, to talk about this issue, one thing that I thought of outside of even you know, China, Chinese money funding these disruptive groups. You know, if you look at the M the NBA coddles mm. China, um, uh, they a, a, an assistant coach for the Houston. I'm doing this all by memory. Assistant coach for the Houston Rockets mildly criticized China and it became That's a big right. international incident to the That's point right. where the NBA's biggest star, LeBron James, um, groveled before the Chinese communists to try to repair the damage done by an assistant coach for an NBA team saying something slightly critical of China. He may have actually even said something just in support of human rights. I mean, it was something very innocuous. It was ridiculous. But the NBA and its biggest star, LeBron James, had to prostrate themselves in front of the Chinese in order to keep the big money from China flowing. Disney, Disney, the biggest entertainment company in the world, coddles China constantly because, I don't know, they have several parks in China. And if they piss off, uh, Xi and the and the ruling regime in China, they are going to lose billions of dollars. So they do whatever it takes to please China, including thanking the Chinese slave laborers or, or you know, mentioning uh, the, the Uyghur labor camp when they made the movie Milan, uh, Mulan, the live action Mulan remake. Um, it, it was it was absurd. And then, you know, you think about uh, Dianne Feinstein, the late great uh, senator from California, Dianne Feinstein. I think for something like more than 20 years, one of her closest personal assistants, maybe I think it was her driver, mm -hmm. was a Chinese spy with one of the most powerful senators in the United States. And nothing was done. That guy's probably still in the United States. I mean, what, what is it about the United States' tepid reactions to Chinese aggression, if not outright cooperation with the, with the Communist Chinese Party in this country that just gets no attention? And seems to get um, you know no attention from our intelligence agencies, from our law enforcement agencies. Yet a uh, a fake phony uh, story about Russia gets right. dozens of people thrown into jail. It's it's you just wonder who, what the hell's going on in this country. Hey, who is that? Who, wait, wait, real quick. Who yeah. is that guy mm -hmm. that ran for president? Uh, Democrat. He ran for president, um, and then he was like sleeping with like a Chinese spy. Eric, Eric Swalwell. Eric Swalwell. <laughs> Sorry, he's having an affair that. with a Chinese yeah, spy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he's, he was still, they couldn't even kick him off the intelligence committee. I mean, you wonder what the hell is going on. I mean, I don't want to go to war with China. Nobody wants that, wants a war. But we're just, basically, the Chinese have, have free reign through uh, covert means, through obviously now nonprofits like Code Pink, to infiltrating our own government. And there just seems to be nothing done about it. Well, and, and you, you got to make sure we get every one, every last one of those damn January 6th people who were within five miles of the Capitol and throw them in jail. But Chinese spies and, and Chinese theft of our technology, it just seems to go unpunished, almost to the point of encouraging it. Yeah, well, okay. And, and this is my question. I said this to you, Chris, I think yesterday when I was like doing research on this or the day before or wherever, but it's like, I understand CNN not covering this. I understand MSNBC not covering this, but like, you know, we, we, we hear stuff from the right side of the aisle. There's plenty of right leaning. I'd not heard about this. I still, two days later, can't wrap my head around that. What's your, what's your view on this story? I've, I've heard of, you know, reports like this. And I, I think this is only the tip of the iceberg. I, I'm going to kind of take a, 30,000 foot view of this and say, uh, first of all, the president of the United States, Joe Biden, is most likely uh, connected with, you know, Chinese influence. So, you know, take that, you know, and, and, and stew on that for a little bit. Uh, but let's look at over the past couple of years, you know, China has uh, flown a spy balloon over the United States. We basically did nothing about it. 
Uh, like Jim said, there have been, you know, countless stories of Chinese spies infiltrating, you know, high levels of the U.S. government. Uh, TikTok is a Chinese company that is basically poisoning the brains of an entire, you know, generation of Americans. Meanwhile, if you look at Chinese TikTok, it's completely different. It's all about like, you know, learning math and physics and all this like, you know, great stuff. So really what this, this is part of, I think, a, you know, much larger effort by the Chinese Communist Party in, you know, recent decades to try to uh, sow discord and decay within the United States. And it looks like it is working like a charm. And, you know, I, I when we were uh, talking about this, I just kind of was wondering myself, gee, why would Code Pink, you know, be on the side of China? But then you kind of think to yourself, well, Code Pink's a very far left organization with, you know, all that, you know, far left uh, philosophy. And I think they look at China and, you know, and, and it's not that they look up to China particularly, but they look at the Chinese model and say, you know, it would be better if that was, you know, more the American model. So mm -hmm. and, and, you know, one other just like, you know, to add another you know element to this whole discussion. Last time I checked in 2020, China unleashed one of the worst you know, pandemics in the world. They lied about it through their teeth. You know, the World Health Organization was in bed with them. Just there's so many like if you just keep peeling the onion back and back, there's there's so much, uh, you know, at the heart of this. And, you know, until the United States wises up and really starts to play hardball with, you know, the would be, you know, uh, competitor to our global dominance. Well, then I think that we're just, you know, not playing on an even playing field. Yeah, we could seriously do an entire episode just pulling up examples of or over examples of just people like kowtowing to to China. Um, the the World Health Organization, the one that sticks out to me was that interview that was being done with some representative of the World Health Organization, and the interviewer had the audacity to say the words Taiwan. And then the the WHO person was like, oh, what? I didn't hear that last question. Don't worry about it. Let's just move on to the next oh, one. Yeah, I and that. then the interviewer is like, just repeated the question using the word Taiwan. And the guy literally, you could see him signing off. <laughs> like the, instead yeah. of answering the question, he signs That's off right. because right. of the fear of mentioning the word Taiwan. But Danny, th 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 there's not only all of that to deal with. It's also, uh, you know, very concerning because we are becoming more and more economically dependent on China. Mm -hmm. That that is not by, you know, by choice. It's you know, it's it's it, it, it's by the, the fact that these. Um, political figures in, in power right now want us to be. So it doesn't, it doesn't have to be this way. They are making the decision to, to go this route. And that's where I just, you know, get, uh, you know, pretty uh, cynical about the state of all this stuff where, you know, part of the uh, problem is when you're, a, you know, like a dying great nation, people I think start to say, well, the, the ship's going down. I want to just get as much as I can while the ship's going down. The ship doesn't have to go down. We're, yeah. we're, 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 you know, uh, making the ship go down, but it doesn't have to go down. Our ship should be floating, you know, uh, like better than ever. We, we talk a lot on this podcast about how the, um, all right, we'll call it the fascistic joining of corporations and government power um, is the most dangerous, um, you know, partnership or marriage to our freedom and liberty. And then as you're talking there, Chris, I was, um, you know, I also had TikTok on my list of things to bring up uh, and COVID as well. Uh, but as you're talking there, I thought what the biggest com company in the world, I think the largest, uh, the most, the largest, most capitalized uh, country or company in the world is Apple, right? If they're not number one, they're definitely top five, top, top 10. Their business would absolutely um, crumble to nothing if they pissed China off. Because that's where all of these iPhones and iPads and iMac and MacBooks that I'm using right now are made. Um, we are so, so many big companies, so much of America's economy is 100% dependent on us shipping off the manufacturing of especially um, technology to China. We're mm -hmm. seeing that now with the so-called EV revolution, which is collapsing under its own weight. But if that was to actually come to fruition... It would be because China is giving us all of the batteries and all of the solar panels and all you know, as, they, as it is now and the wind turbines and all that stuff. It's all it's all made in China. So we are so dependent on them economically. That's why the NBA grovels in front of China. That's why Disney grovels before China. That's why um, uh, Apple doesn't say anything about human rights. Um, that's why Google, whose, whose motto used to be don't be evil or was it don't do evil. Either way, um, they have a lot of interest in China as well. And so they'll never say anything about the evils of, of that society that and mm. it's it's multi-layered, including slavery 
and yeah, remember human rights. I mean, it's and so we're so dependent on them. That's why you, I mean, Donald Trump. You know, he'd say China. You know, he was the only politician that 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 I recall in the last ten years to take a realistically firm stance against China and its aims to dominate the world. Um, but now he's gone, and uh, all we have, it seems, are politicians who um, are and and corporations who are coddling up to China. And this is not going to be good for the United States or, frankly, the world. Jim, yeah, I, I, I think I sorry, Dan, just real quick. I, Jim, I think that they're still stuck in that late 90s, early 2000s mindset that if we just engage with China and we, uh, you know, trade with them, then they will become, you know, more more liberal. That's just not true. That hasn't happened. The actual opposite has happened. They've stolen our intellectual property. They have, you know, uh, made terrible deals with uh, U.S. corporations that that uh, work in China. Basically, you have to have they get to have 51 percent uh, ownership. It's just like all these things. And yet we're like we're like the 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 ex-girlfriend that just keeps going back to the to well, the you know, terrible, you know, to the terrible, uh, you know, abuser. It's just it, and, and the only place that did show any signs of like liberalizing Hong Kong when there was uprisings there, uh, the big authoritarian boot of China kind of squashed that out pretty quickly. So. So, yeah, and then there uh, also to Jim's point, um, this is going back a couple of years, but there was like some report from like the Australian Strategic Institute or something like that. It was some like Australia based outfit, but they did a report on all the different companies, big companies that had ties specifically to Chinese slave labor camps in uh, Xinjiang. And it was like basically any company you've ever heard of. And again, like eh, there were some rumblings here and there. I think there was an article on like Breitbart or something like that. But that was it. You know, that's that's all the, the noise that came from that. Um, one other last example. And I, there's a few other things that I want to that I want to hit on. So I just but we have to play this clip. This is a, another prime example of just like the cow towing to China. And it was John Cena who was promoting his Fast and Furious franchise. This is, a, again, a, like a couple of years ago. And he had the audacity of saying the word Taiwan. And it caused all this outrage to a point where they were going to not even play the movie in China, which would mean that studio would lose out on hundreds of millions of dollars probably. So what did they do? They marched out John Cena to apologize. Let's go ahead and play some of this clip, Andy. As much as I can bear. I don't know if we could do that. Um, All right, that's it. I'm I'm done. I'm done. I can't even watch any more of it. The point is that he had to grovel to the Chinese. He's not. He's not groveling to the Chinese people. He's groveling to the rulers of the Chinese Communist Party. Right there. Please play our movie in China. We need to make this money. It's a joke. It's an absolute joke. And there's limitless examples that we've already talked about a dozen or so. Well, it's it's funny. He he says he made a mistake. He will not identify the mistake by making the mistake of saying the word Taiwan again. Right. Uh, and so, and you know, I'm pretty impressed. He knows Mandarin. He seems to speak it pretty well. So that's uh, that's impressive for a uh, for professional wrestler. I wouldn't have thought uh, he would have had the time or the or the inclination to to learn Mandarin. But nice job. But but yeah, I mean, groveling. I mean, he had to grovel. He, obviously, the studio was going to lose hundreds of millions of dollars. They love the Fast and Furious franchise over there in China. It's it's you know. It's blow it up fun. It's a lot of fun. But, uh, you know, and to do it in in Mandarin and to grovel like that, it's just, you know, what other what? Why would you need to grovel for that? Why? So you can't. I mean, when you watch the Olympics, they don't call it Taiwan. They call it Chinese Taipei. Right. Isn't that what they call the country Mm. in the Olympics as well? Mm. So, you know, the entire world is tiptoeing around China. It's just kind of sickening, to be honest. Yeah, so I went further down this rabbit hole when I was uh, reading through all of this. So in this New York Times article, uh, there was a mention of a a handful of key terms that stuck out to me uh, that I made note of when I was doing my research that I wanted to go back to and kind of expand on. Uh, In fact, I think most of these key terms all came in one paragraph of the article. This this article says he uh, and his allies talking about that Mr. Singham are on the front lines of what the Communist Party officials call a, quote, smokeless war. Under the rule of Xi Jinping, China has expanded state media operations, teamed up with overseas outlets, and cultivated foreign influencers. The goal is to disguise propaganda as independent content. So uh, let's first look at 
teamed up with overseas outlets. So looking up this term and, and everything around it led me to another New York Times article that uh, that referred me to a report published by the International Federation of Journalists, which is apparently the largest global union federation of journalists, trade unions in the world. The report that they released was titled China, the COVID-19 story unmasking China's global strategy. This report describes how China during the start of COVID activated an existing global media infrastructure to seed positive narratives about the country. This global media infrastructure includes, quote, training programs and sponsored trips for global journalists, content sharing agreements, feeding state sponsored messages into the global news ecosystems, memorandum of understanding with global journalism unions and increased ownership of publishing platforms. China weaponized foreign journalist visas to essentially force resident journalists out of the country. And in their absence, media outlets had to rely on state approved content released by the government. They also began creating content that was tailor made for specific international audiences. They also leveraged social media to spread their narratives to the world. In Italy, in a specific case, uh, one of the earliest victims of the coronavirus pandemic, this is reading from this uh, report, China was seen as actively propagating disinformation regarding COVID-19. State actors disseminated doctored videos, spread false information suggesting COVID-19 originated from Italy and seeded the incorrect narrative that hand washing did not succeed in preventing the spread of COVID-19. In another case, a foreign ministry spokesman Zhao Lijiang uh, tweeted a fake news story claiming that COVID was brought to the United States by U.S. soldiers attending the Army Games in Wuhan. These and other fake news stories were amplified across social media by an army of Chinese ambassadors, other foreign ministry spokesmen, and paid trolls. And just to give you a sense of the scale of these operations, in June of 2020, Twitter removed 23,000 Chinese accounts at the core of a highly organized network, which fed into another 150,000 accounts that amplified this content. So according to this report, uh, China is coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic with more positive global news coverage of its actions and policies than pre-pandemic. I mean, that is pretty, uh, that's a pretty powerful propaganda machine that you've got, a, a global media system that you've got going on there. When China, which not only did the, the, the uh, COVID originate from, but they just handled it in the most authoritarian ways possible, came out of the other end of that smelling better than going into it. What do you think about all this, Chris? I remember when it, you know, when the pandemic story was first breaking and Donald Trump was having some press conferences and some of the reporters at the White House press pool were just, you know, beside themselves for him even pointing out the fact that this originated in China. So I mean, I, I remember just at the, at the the very beginning of this stuff in, uh, you know, spring of 2020, just being bewildered, like, why are they going out of their way to defend China? This is the place where it obviously, you know, originated from. They're kind of the bad guys in the situation. At least that's what it seemed like from the very beginning. And then also the, you know, Wuhan lab cover up and all that stuff. But Donnie, I think, you know, one other element of this that uh, we haven't mentioned yet is the fact that China is also making inroad, inroads <clears throat> in uh uh, higher learning uh, in the United States and even at the um, uh, middle school and high school level too, uh, they're funding um, these programs, whether they're Confucius Institutes or all other mm -hmm. sorts of stuff, trying to, uh, you know, win the hearts and minds of America's uh, youth. And it looks to me like that's working pretty damn well with that and TikTok. I think that that's, that is part of their, I think, really long-term strategy. Um, and also the the fentanyl crisis is to just make, you know, America uh, America's uh, young generation just almost, you know, like like useless, and you know, I, I I've you know uh, read a lot about this fentanyl stuff, and you know, um, tried to watch a lot of documentaries about it. And this, you know, in in the Chinese mind, and I'm not trying to like defend them by any means, but this goes back to the opium wars, and where they're saying, wait a second, you know, United States and uh, England, you came in and you got us to do the opium, and you know, kind of ruined us for a while. Now this is our big revenge. I think that's a completely flawed argument. But I think that we need to start taking this stuff really seriously. 
Yeah, no, I mean, it's, <clears throat> it's this report was pretty interesting reading through this, outlining and detailing their quote unquote global media infrastructure. Uh, Jim, I mean, it, 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 when you t when we talk about it, it doesn't seem like it should be surprising. But I feel like a lot of people, when they think about China, they think about like 90s China or 80s China, where it was a fraction of the size in terms of their power and influence of what it is today. Uh, do you think people aren't kind of taking this as serious as they should? What do you think? Yeah, I think they're not. I mean, I think China is is a, um, you know, we keep calling it a strategic rival and we, and we kind of talk our way around what's really going on here. But it, you, I, there's a part of me that almost wants to just tip my hat and, and applaud because there, China has United States and our culture read right down to the very last piece of punctuation. They know exactly what they're doing and they know exactly the weak points to hit in the United States to advance their propaganda. There's a lot of politicians, including, I guess, Eric Swalwell in their pocket uh, and, and, and Dianne Feinstein, you know, they have a spy over there. Um, they, they keep probing for weakness and the unfortunate thing is that they keep finding it. And the idea that they are funding uh, journalism uh, to make sure that China gets good press in this country. Right. Um, that when you mentioned that, I, I, I was thinking, I thought of two, a couple of things. One is um, we, we have a lot, uh, I wouldn't call it a partnership, but we work a lot with the Epic Times, which is the only freedom loving newspaper that covers China the way it should be um, by Chinese expats who oppose the Communist Party in that country. They have had their presses here in the United States attacked by Chinese spy goons. Mm. They've, had, they've come under physical attack for wanting to um, counter Chinese Communist Party propaganda. So those are the brave, some of the bravest journalists in this country. As, as, as American journalists, you know, in the in the legacy media, try to pretend that they're like firefighters running to the trouble and all that nonsense. They're, instead of just well, peddling the um, the regime line in the United States, and increasingly it seems the Chinese Communist Party's line uh, on the world and on themselves, and running interference for them. Um, but so they know the best way to do that is to pay journalists and to fund journalism in the United States so that they can get their message across. That's how you're, that's um, one of the most underreported media stories mm -hmm. uh, over the last year is the fact that um, hard left green groups and wealthy billionaires who are um, green fanatics and cult members are funding, are giving money to organizations like the Associated Press to fund all of their climate coverage. And so what a surprise, all of their climate coverage, all of it, is 100% green cult propaganda. And so China sees that sort of thing. And so they're going to pay for their own journalism too, because you get what you pay for. Uh, journalism is a dying industry in this country. So, you know, media outlets are, are literally life and death. They need funding to survive or they're just going to go away. And they, they will apparently take it from anywhere that it'll come and they will sacrifice whatever um, small bit of journalism, journalistic integrity they, they have left and just sacrifice that on the money um, coming from China and then increasingly from uh, deep pocketed left wing green groups. So, you know, this won't last forever. Uh, I think there, there might be a history of journalism written someday, maybe in 2100. that will look back on kind of the death throes of the traditional journalism that we knew in this country and how it got bought and paid for by, frankly, enemies of the United States. That's pretty. I mean, that should be pretty troubling to people. But, you know, that's why. While we can't, while we still have it, you can come to outlets. You can come to content creators on YouTube and talk about the issues without Chinese oh, interference. <laughs> Boom! So, no, wait. Perfect segue. Perfect segue. We're talking about YouTube. All right, because there was another uh -oh. uh, key phrase in that uh, paragraph that I read in that one New York Times article where they talked specifically about cultivating foreign influencers. So let's get into this article. So uh, this led me to another New York Times article. Apparently, they didn't cover in this stuff titled How Beijing Influences the Influencers. The article outlines how China government funds and incentivizes influencers and YouTubers who together have millions of followers on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. The goal is to promote an artificial set of authentic takes on how great China is, countering any negative perception of the country. The article gives a bunch of creators uh, and examples of creators that are funded and incentivized by the Chinese government. One YouTuber named Raz Gal Or, 
uh, who amongst his pro-China content has a video where he goes and visits Xinjiang, perhaps the most oppressed province in China. The intention, the specific intention of this video is clearly to counter allegations of forced labor in the region. Raz enjoys laughs and food with locals before declaring, quote, it's totally normal here. People are nice, doing their job, living their life. So all of these stories, and this is reading between the lines, all of these stories about slave camps and all of that. Now, come on, look, we're eating kebabs. We're having fun over here. They give a few other examples, too, before explaining how the regime uses their understanding of social media algorithms and their army of bots and other profiles to boost these channels that they have ties to. So if they get all of their bots and everything to like and share and comment on a video, it gets shown to more people, kind of reflecting the message that I put at the beginning of this episode. But hey, I'm not funded by China. So, uh, Jim, since you brought up the idea of this kind of independent takes on on YouTube, uh, what, what's your reaction to finding out that there's a whole fake uh, set of influencers on these social media things that are being influenced by China, being funded by China to spread fake news and misinformation. What are your thoughts? Oh, I'm not surprised at all. Um, actually, I was I was shaking my head in disgust as Andy was scrolling uh, through and they played some of the videos, um, you know, to see, God, you know, I, I was raised and, and, and lived much of my life in a very different America where the idea that you would, uh, that Americans would take money or maybe even just do it voluntarily propagandize for a vicious regime like China um, would just be unthinkable. You know, did you guys watch Oppenheimer, the movie Oppenheimer? Not yet. It's on my list. All right. Well, um, you know, part of the plot, you know, was was kind of the Red Scare. Oppenheimer, he had a uh, he was having an affair with a woman who was a member of the Communist Party USA, and he would go to CPUSA meetings. Uh, he never joined the party himself, but he was super friendly with, uh, with commies in this country. And the Communist Party USA was supported by the Soviet Union to undermine this country. And so it was troublesome that the head of the Manhattan Project, who invented the atomic bomb, was being uh, very friendly with, uh, with commies who were in the employ and doing the bidding of the Soviet Union. And as it turned out, maybe not related to that, um, uh, to his you know, familiarity and, and friendships and, <laughs> and sexual relationships with, with commies in this country, that a Soviet spy was actually part of the Manhattan Project. And that's um, um, how and why the uh, Soviets got the bomb, I believe. Um, because we did all the work. So every the whole world always steals all of our great ideas and technology and, and knowledge. It's pretty frustrating. It's been happening for a hundred, you know, for a hundred years. But I, I thought of that as you were as as Andy was scrolling through that. Um, you know, there was a time where it would be inconceivable that Americans would publicly support um an oppressive regime like China and and make excuses. I mean, one of those videos was like, wasn't it basically Andy saying that like the the idea that there are forced labor camps and, and slavery and that Uyghurs are oppressed in China is just um, Western propaganda and not yep. the truth. I mean, that's disgusting. Uh, but it's, I guess, a, a YouTuber, a, a, a so-called um, content creator for YouTube is a pretty cheap date. Um, if all it takes is uh, unleashing some bots to make your, uh, to make your channel popular, mm -hmm. which gives you a, a, a tremendous endorphin high when you see all of those likes and you see all those subscribers. And then of course, if your channel is monetized, you make money off of that too. And they might as well have some direct payments. Um, yeah, there's one of the videos that I almost threw up. Maybe it was America first to infect the world with coronavirus. I mean, that's, that's disgusting. Talk about mis and disinformation. Again, yeah. our government, our regime comes after channels like this and the listeners of this podcast and monitors our, our speech for any hint of dis and mis, you know, mis and disinformation. Yet what's really happening is that it's the regimes themselves that are spreading mis and disinformation. And in this case, it's the Chinese regime spreading disinformation through the mouths of Americans. And that's apparently not a, that big a deal. I mean, you know, yay for the New York Times and actually reporting on this. I did not read through the whole story. I have a feeling the tone could have been a little bit more critical of it, but um, at least it's out there. 
Oh uh, yeah, uh, Chris, I got one other kind of story that I want to get to, but if you have something specific to say about these influencers, you can jump in or yeah, just just, just just re- no, just real quick. Uh, first of all, I think these are mostly useful idiots. I don't th- I don't really t- or care what they're saying or what they're doing, but I think that uh, part of the responsibility lies with the American education system because we've been teaching people for so many decades now that America is a terrible place. And if you just keep instilling that message over and over again, and it starts to resonate in people's heads, well, then of course they're going to look abroad and say, well, America sucks, but maybe they're a better country. So I think that part of this is is happening, you know, from yeah. China to here. But, you know, when you think back in the 19, like 50s and 60s, you know, this didn't happen because I think most, you know, Americans still at that time thought, well, the Soviet Union, they're, they're the bad guys. We're the good guys. But everything is just so flipped so much. And I think a lot of this, you know, and I've said this many times in this podcast, it originates with, you know, academia and uh, the poison that they are, you know, spewing to, um, you know, America's youth, whether it's, you know, the Palestine situation, the China situation, you know, President Trump or just like anything. Yeah, you know, and and all of these articles, which are linked in the show notes, have so much more information in them than I could possibly have the time to talk about all the details in this. But it talks about how some of these influencers um, are allowed in certain areas that even like journalists aren't allowed in uh, so that they can give like, you know, glowing reviews of different like that, like that one video that was playing with this like large hotels and all of this, the government will pay for their stay and travel and all of in many cases. So it's very much incentivized and, and funded and they go into the details on all of that. One one other, just super quick uh, point on this. The fact that we even give these people like a pedestal, the fact that we even care what they have to say is just, I think so representative of the, you know, decadence of America where we don't actually take the time to go and read and learn about things. We look at a, at a, you know, YouTube or a TikTok video and in 15 seconds, we make a, uh, you know, uh, 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 we, we, we come up with a worldview on something that's very complicated. Mm-hmm. It's just ridiculous, but it also just goes to show the dumbing down of, uh, you know, I'm sad to say this, most Americans. Right, right, right. Uh, so one of the last things that I want to mention real quick, we're already north of an hour here, but uh, is the idea of a smokeless war. This was a term that stuck out to me in that one paragraph that I read. And if you were to Google this, that you find basically nothing but a book about China titled Smokeless War that came out a year and a half ago, something like that, maybe two years ago. But if you refine your searches, you will find a bunch of articles prior to that release of that book. Uh, talking about this concept of a smokeless war. One of the articles that I found was from The Economist titled Cat and Mouse, How China Makes Sure Its Internet Abides by the Rules. Now, warning, this article is like 11 years old. I think it was published in 2013, something like that. But the article explains how there's been a policy towards censoring and manipulating the internet in China since at least 2005. Uh, This 2005, it's... uh, they're referencing a internal party speech where a diplomat spoke of this idea of a smokeless war being waged on the internet uh, by China's enemies and the need to defend the party. And reading from this article, it says, according to a prominent blogger, quote, the authorities had felt the internet was out of control and they needed to address it immediately. At the end of 2005, they had a meeting in Shindoa to study how to control the internet. I know my pronunciation is just terrible. Anyways, they started to hire online commentators to steer conversation in the right direction, who became known as the 50 cent party. Nothing to do with the rapper, Andy, calm down, because they were paid 50 Chinese cents per post. In January of 2007, the same official gave a speech at the uh, po- uh, political bureau calling for it to, quote, assert supremacy over online public opinion and, quote, study the art of online guidance. Controlling the Internet was not enough. The party also needed to use the Internet, said the official. So the article goes into more detail, but the point of uh, the point of all of it is that there has been a policy of waging a smokeless war on the Internet in China for at least 20 years now. So, Jim, just to kind of bring it all kind of full circle here, I think that uh, I think that we have to start 
and give me your opinion on on this statement. I think that we do have to start taking like misinformation seriously. I think that we often have a knee jerk reaction towards kind of scoffing at these accusations of of R- Russian or Chinese misinformation, and it has essentially become a joke. Obviously, because the left overplayed their hand when it came to Trump on all of this stuff. But governments around the world, including our own, to some degree or another, you know, that's a that's the topic of a discussion we could have in the future, uh, are waging inf- information wars. And to think that China and Russia aren't doing this is pretty crazy. And and the last thing I'll say is that like I can agree with a lot of the panels and stuff that we talked about uh, at Davos when they're talking about the threats of misinformation, disinformation. But where we would differ is on the proposed solutions to that problem, right? I, I think that uh, any of the solutions to these problems discussed in by the Davos crowd or anything like that is usually like, let's give more power to the government. Perhaps we should create some new centralized regulatory body or something like that, which, you know, again, we could disagree with that. But my main point is that I do think we have to take misinformation seriously. What do you think about all that? I will say that um, I'm, 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 I'm a free speech ab- absolutist, right? And I think the answer to even I, I wouldn't. Even, I don't. I don't want to call it misinformation. I want to call it propaganda. We are propagandized all the time by our own media, so-called legacy media in this country. Obviously, the Chinese are um, on, undertaking an enormous propaganda campaign in the United States. I think people. The, the fact that this is being reported on, the fact that China controls its own internet, but exploits our uh, open internet in the West. And now Western governments and um, companies, again, that, that, that fascistic marriage of corporations and government seem to be taking a lesson from China to try to replicate a uh, regulated internet here, um, only allowing approved speech. Um, and all of that that isn't approved by government will be banned, shadow banned, um, perhaps even made into a actual crime. So to me, I'm sure, the is China and Russia and and other countries, uh, maybe Canada is doing it too, trying to influence the thinking of ordinary Americans through propaganda that is disseminated on the internet. Yes, of course, and that's always going to happen. Um, what the answer to that is is not to uh, crack down, not to have basically not to have a centralized government decide what is bad information and crack down on it. I think mm-hmm. the way to 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 battle this is more speech and more information and, and less restrictions on what people can say and where they can say it, because the truth will out in the end. I really do believe that. Chris, final words on anything, uh, anything that we've talked about so far on this episode. I agree with Jim. And uh, you know, 10, 20 years ago, the word misinformation was not used nearly as much as it is today. And uh, you, I, I'm, I'm with Jim. I think that one person's misinformation is another person's opinion. And I don't want any any government officials or any government you know department determining what is and is not misinformation because the source of most misinformation is government itself. I think that what this really shows is that the uh, the the government you know in the United States looks at how China can control and manipulate the internet for its own purposes and says, we want to do that here. And like Jim said, they're already doing it with uh, coordination from uh, most of these social media companies that are you know in bed with the government and we know that for a fact thanks thanks to uh, elon musk and the twitter files and all that stuff but I, I i agree with jim my bottom line is is that you know we live in a free country freedom of speech everyone's allowed to have an opinion this notion of misinformation and that we can guarantee with you know 100 certainty that that something like you know whether the earth is heating or cooling we can just know that for a fact that that's that's just not true like whatever happened to the um to, to the robust discourse that made the united states the greatest nation on earth we have to get back to that mm-hmm. Yep. The last thing I want to say is just a final uh, call out and thank you to Abel in the chat who uh, uh, sent me this this uh, this story with Nancy Pelosi yelling at those protesters early in the week. And that set off a little snowball that led me to looking into all of this stuff. This entire episode was based on Abel sending me that video. So thank you again, Abel, for that. Uh, and thank all of you for tuning into this episode of the In The Tank podcast. We do an episode every week on 
Thursday at noon central time where we are live streaming on Facebook and YouTube and X and Rumble and all of that. Join the conversation. Throw your comments in the chat. Throw your questions in there. Maybe we'll show your comments on the screen. Maybe we'll address your questions on the fly. Super chat functionality is enabled if you want to support the show that way. Or else you could just hit that like button, share this content, subscribe if you haven't already, or just leaving a comment under the video. All helps break through those big tech algorithms that prevent content like this from being shown to more people. If you'd like, you can follow us on X at In The Tank Pod, or you can send us your comments, suggestions, or questions to the show by emailing us at In The Tank Podcast at gmail.com. Jim Lakely, where can the fine people find you? At Heartland Inst on X, at, at, at Jay Lakely on X. I can't say it now. And always visit heartland.org. Fantastic. Chris Talgo, what do you have to pitch today? Oh, heartland.org has some great stuff, and we have some really great stuff coming soon. So please go check it out very soon. Fantastic. All right. Thank you all for tuning in. We'll talk to you next week. He's a lion dog-faced pony, sir.